episode of the Silver Bullets podcast. I'm Michael Citro. And I'm Chip Minnick. Chip, I don't know how you've been. We've last uh, spoken the week after Thanksgiving when, I don't know, some football game happened over the weekend. It kind of, I blacked it out. I don't really remember it very well, but some football game happened. I'm sure we talked about it. And uh, and then we took our leave of uh, of this podcast until just now. I know it, it's been crazy, uh, you know, in terms of a lot of things happening on the Ohio State front. Uh, but like you said, there was a, a game of significance that you and I, I think, are just trying to kind of, you know, basically block it out of our memories. I think like most Ohio State fans. Yeah. See, when I was younger and my body would bounce back quicker and it was the John Cooper era, I would just drink a lot. OK, I was going to say, like, I was hoping like I was going to try and call on. You know, not to be a spoiler, but like Doctor Strange, you know, like maybe like he could invoke a spell that would make me forget this whole nasty episode. But um, yeah, I, alcohol, the, the cause of and solution to all of life's problems, as Homer Simpson would say. <laughs> yes, he would. And now we are officially a Buckeye Scoop podcast because we have a Simpsons reference. There you go. There you go. All right, uh, Chip, we will talk about the Rose Bowl. Uh, a little later in the program. Why don't we kind of catch up on what has been going on with the program since you and I last spoke. There's been quite a few things that have happened with Ohio State University and the football program. Let's not talk about the basketball team that can't seem to get on the court. Let's just talk about the football team. And right now, as I understand it, there's a whole bunch of recruits that have signed their name on some paper, faxed it in, and they would uh, expressed they have expressed their intent to come to Ohio State and play football. And that fax, as you know, is about as um, meaningful as any other fax in the year 2021 because we don't know what will happen between now and then. We've got a transfer portal. Kids already have been sticking their name in the portal after you know after signing day in the past so there's no guarantees anymore if somebody faxes that thing in that they're actually going to play for that school that's correct uh there there are 18 young men who signed uh for the early signing period just to reiterate the fact that uh ohio state um has been able to publicly disclose and announce you know comments uh about uh, the 18 players who have signed, but Ryan Day on the early signing period did say something to the effect that he anticipates more individuals coming forth to sign with Ohio State. Uh, you know, there are some high school all-star games that are going to be played beginning of January. The the later signing period that you and I and most college football fans have come to, uh, I guess you could say, uh, have come to, to know and love in February. That's still, you know, national letter of intent day is still going to take place in February. Um, so I can't sit here and tell you, Oh yeah. You know, it's like, it's only going to sit at 18 it, there. It sounds like Ohio state and Ryan day are fairly confident. They're going to add to the recruiting class. How mm-hmm. many players, which players I, I be, you know, we have, we have far more talented people on Buckeye scoop that could, <laughs> could give you, Uh, better educated guesses as to which players are going to eventually sign with Ohio state in January or February. But you know, you and I, we could talk about any of the 18 who did sign in the early signing period. Yeah. We need to know who the JT Tui Molo is going to be of this class. Who's going to be that last, who's going to be that last holdout uh, making their decision, that kind of thing. That's the thing. Like I said, we might be, we might be finding out in a week. We might be finding out in, uh, you know, like the beginning of February, it, it might be that long. I, I hope it's not. Um, but honestly, it's the kind of thing where Ryan Day sounded fairly confident that there were going to be some other individuals based on, you know, some of the, as I, as I just invoked a few moments ago, you know, some of the, the more recruiting oriented people like Alex Gleitman, you know, Bill Bank Green, Mark Givler, et cetera, yeah. uh, who follow this. Uh, they could give you the names of of these players about oh I I think you know so and so or whoever is going to be signing in January or February but you know again we'll we'll have to wait and see you know when when it when it's all said and done yeah not a ton of surprises from what I understand as a novice who doesn't follow recruiting as as carefully as some of those other guys you just talked about 
Uh, but apparently another defensive back flipped on uh, the uh, the day of the uh, the early signing period. And that wasn't completely unexpected, but it's always annoying when that happens. It is. Uh, <laughs> Terrence Brooks, Terrence Brooks, uh, who's from Texas uh, on signing day, as you as you mentioned, he did flip uh, from Ohio State. He had been verbally committed in the summer to Ohio State. And to the best of my knowledge, like you said, you know, I, I, I will certainly claim that that category of novice with you <laughs> um, that Terrence Brooks, I guess it was starting to seem more and more likely that he was going to flip in the days leading up to the early signing period that Terrence Brooks was going to flip from Ohio State to Texas. That did wind up happening, which was a disappointment because as you and I even being novices on the recruiting side, the secondary was not necessarily a position of strength for Ohio State. So to lose one of your recruits on the early in, in the early signing period was a disappointment. Fortunately for Ohio State, they did land a number of other defensive backs. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jair Brown um, from from Ohio, uh, the Cincinnati area, he signed. Uh, as a matter of fact, I believe he was the very first player to send in that fax, uh, you know, on the early signing period. Kai Stokes, a safety, Ryan, a Ryan Turner, a cornerback. Uh, so it kind of remains, remains to be seen. You know, I just rattled off three players there. Um, you, you referenced the transfer portal. Who knows if Ohio State is going to look to the transfer portal to supplement the secondary, uh, if they're going to look for other defensive backs, uh, you know, possibly in January or February, you know, to, to possibly uh, commit to Ohio state. Yeah, that was a, a position of strength. And I know that uh, Tony Gerdeman and Tom Orr had talked many times on their podcast, the Buckeye weekly about the, the strength of the position group defensive back, how it was looking and how it was expected for one to two players to maybe flip. And, and indeed uh, that was the second one. So uh, kind of went, as they kind of thought it would. And, and of course, they're always in contact with the Alex Gleitmans and, and those guys that uh, that followed the recruiting, uh, Bill Bank Green and, and Mark Gibbler and those guys. So um, it looks like those guys kind of know what they're talking about. Absolutely. I mean, they, <laughs> they follow, they follow, I mean, like they were also, you know, speaking of a defensive back that I did not reference um, just because based on, you know, give, giving credit where credit is due, you know, um, you know, anyone on Buckeye scoop um, that has heard like Mark Gibbler or Bill Bank Green or Alex Lightman, um, a player who is being classified as a safety in the, in the recruiting class, but uh, Bill Bank Green, Alex, um, Mark Gibbler, they're, they're projecting Sonny Styles to be a linebacker at Ohio state. Now he's, you know, I, you know, if anything, um, you know, he's one of these guys who was originally uh, in the 2023 class reclassified as a 22, uh, a 2022 recruit. Um, So he will be showing up this summer. He is not going to be one of the players who will be uh, enrolling early in January. Um, But more than likely, it sounds like he is the kind of player that even though he played all over, um, an Ohio kid for uh, Pickerington uh, that he played all over on defense that he might project at linebacker at the next level for Ohio state. Very excited about having Sonny styles, about having a, um, it's always great to have a legacy player come in, somebody that you watch their, their dad play. It's always uh, fun to have that person uh, come in and play for Ohio state. And it also makes me feel old. I don't know about you, but it makes me feel <laughs> very old when we start talking about the sons of players that, that you and I watched. But yeah, it is. Uh, every every indication um, that I have getting back to Sonny Styles uh, um, in terms of his ability is that you know he was just that dominant. Um, you know that he you know sometimes uh, you know again you know played safety, but also could play linebacker, could be uh, a pass rusher in. Ryan Day was excited about the, you know, base, you know, just the flexibility and the opportunity to deploy Sonny Styles, however and wherever as needed on that yeah. defense. So it's it's going to. I know later on in the podcast we're going to be talking about the new defensive coordinator coming in, mm-hmm. uh, and I don't want to put too too much pressure on 
a player who, as I said a few moments ago, are reclassified. But, you know, it certainly sounds as though like Sonny Styles has the potential to make an impact, if not in 2022, uh, somewhere down the road for Ohio State in a wide variety of different areas on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah. Uh, the Buckeyes also uh, shored up some losses at the quarter in the quarterback room with uh, the addition of Devin Brown. What do we know about Devin Brown? That he, uh, again, we're going to feel old here, uh, previously <laughs> coached previously coached by another name that is familiar to Ohio State fans, and that was uh, prior to uh, Devin Brown uh, moving to uh, Utah, he was actually coached by Joe Germain. Uh, and Joe mm-hmm. Germain uh, had nothing but uh, outstanding praise for Devin Brown. He is a... Uh, not only uh, a, a tremendous passer, but also a threat with his legs. And that's something that, let's face it, you know, when it comes to the quarterback position, I don't think the, the days of, you know, having a guy who could just stand in the pocket and just throw, I think you need to have somebody who can escape out of the pocket if, if things break down. Um, and what's great about Devin Brown is I think he's coming in. He helps to replenish that quarterback depth. Mm-hmm. Um, there, I know we're going to talk about you know transfers uh, also in the podcast, but uh, you know he will come in. Uh, I believe he's going to be an early enrollee. I may be mistaken, uh, mm-hmm. but he'll be coming in and he'll be competing um, with Kyle McCord for that backup position uh, behind C.J. Stroud. And I think you know Devin Brown, um, from all indications of everything I read, is that uh, you know in terms of the recruiting camps like the Elite Eleven that he was. Uh, outstanding when he was out there. So I think Ryan day certainly was excited uh, to be able to land a quarterback, the caliber of Devin Brown and bring him into that quarterback room. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, chip, I will not have you body shaming Kent Graham and Jim Carsados here on this program. I meant no, no, <laughs> I, I meant no disrespect. No. Uh, and secondly, if you can't trust a legend like Joey G, who can you trust? There you go. Exactly. So exactly. looking forward, looking forward to Devin Brown in a, a much more um, probably complete way than I was looking forward to Quinn Ewers and the mullet. Don't have to worry about the cognitive dissonance of rooting for a guy with the mullet now because he has, uh, since you and I last spoke, entered the transfer portal along with Jack Miller. They're both gone. Quinn Ewers goes to Texas. Jack Miller goes to Florida where apparently all Ohio State quarterbacks go now, the SEC. Yeah, it um the Quinn you know Quinn Ewers going to Texas, that was that was a shock. That was a, I mean like it was I guess you would say, you know, the fact that as you said it was, you know, one of those things where all right, you know, we we kind of expected I'm I'll, I'll talk about Jack Miller here in a moment, but you know, kind of expected Jack Miller to be moving on mm-hmm. uh, after this season and for Quinn Ewers to leave, you know, after, you know, such, you know, like the, the Ballyhooed recruitment and the fact that he had reclassified, it was a surprise. I wish, you know, uh, nothing but the best for, for Quinn Ewers at Texas. I kind of wonder if, you know, if when all things are said and done that, you know, was it really worth it to give up? that last year of high school, don't get me wrong, you know, whatever the 1.5 or 1.8 million, as well as the, the vehicle that he had and all those wonderful things that he got due to name, image, and likeness. Um, but I just kind of, I just think in the back of my mind, if he had been a little bit more patient um, and stayed, you know, for his senior year of high school and come in, um, as Ohio state probably wanted, they couldn't, they, they couldn't say, no, you, you can't come, but they, I'm sure Ohio state wanted him to be enrolling in January of 2022 versus enrolling in the summer of 2021. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it, it just, I, I think the circumstances could have been better. Um, I think Ohio state recovered. We, we were just talking about Devin Brown as, as well as they possibly could uh, all things considered, you know, it's like they, you know, they, they lost Quinn Ewers, uh, in, in fairness to Devin Brown, he, he verbally committed even before Quinn Ewers, uh, uh, announced his uh, intentions to enter the transfer portal. But, 
Um, wish Quinn Ewers nothing but the best. We'll see how it goes for him down in Texas. I think the expectations for him down in Texas are going to be sky high, uh, being from the state of Texas. And, you know, if uh, I'll be interested to see how it goes, if he is not named the starter in the spring or in the, in the fall camp under Steve Sarkeesian getting to Jack Miller, uh, the surprise for me, and this is, I, I wish Jack Miller nothing but the best because I think he was a, you know, he kind of saw the writing on the wall, but I never heard uh, too much displeasure or discontent from him while he was in Columbus is that being from the West coast, I truly anticipated more of a pack, you know, pack 12 or, you know, something more on the Western side of the United States for him to go to the Southeastern conference in Florida was kind of the surprise for me. But again, I think he, I think he's excited about the opportunity to play for Billy Napier, the new head coach. Maybe he sees an offense that is going to be conducive to his skill set. And as I said about Quinn Ewers, I wish Jack Miller nothing but the best uh, for him at Florida. Yeah, well, we like we talked about on this program, Jack Miller, when he got his uh, his uh, little trouble with the law, we figured that the probably he was going to be the one to go, and that proved to be true with Quinn Ewers like I was surprised I mean this is a kid who could have been the primary backup to CJ Stroud for one year and then taken over the offense the year after in what should have been his second year of college right but uh in instead he he goes back maybe get homesick maybe just didn't like the cold I don't know maybe he's not a big fan of Apollo's Euros which is ludicrous but maybe that's the case Whatever the reason, he decided to transfer to Texas. Apparently, because Texas is back, because Texas is perennially always back, um, so he's going to go to Texas and uh, join the uh, the flipped recruit down there, <laughs> and uh, maybe with the uh, guys that uh, originally pledged to Ohio State, maybe Texas can actually get back. Well, he's not only going to be with Terrence Brooks, he's also one of his teammates, Ryan Watts, uh, Mm -hmm. is also, uh, he entered the transfer portal. Um, That was, you know, we talked about um, when we were talking about the recruiting side of things, uh, the secondary definitely in terms of the depth, uh, you know, there's, there's a hit. You know, Ryan Watts didn't play nearly as well as I would have anticipated based on some of the, the glimpses that we saw uh, this past season. Um, again, maybe Ryan Watts felt homesick. But, um, yeah, Ryan Watts is one of those guys who entered that transfer portal along with Quinn Ewers. Yeah, and there will be some changes on the defensive side of the football in terms of the coaching staff. We know that already going in. Maybe that plays into some of this that's been going on. It's going to be a new defensive coordinator. I don't really know what that means in terms of losses, in terms of who will be going um, overall or, or how many changes will be made. I, I don't think that the final domino has fallen on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, we just know that Jim Knowles is coming in. Yeah, and this is exciting in the sense that Jim Knowles, uh, you know, I'll, I'll freely admit, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be anxious to see um, when that press conference, because from what I have been hearing and I guess that Ryan Day has said, yes, Jim Knowles will be meeting with the media when he is officially taking over the defensive coordinator position as of January 2nd. Mm-hmm. And I, not not that not that I'm anticipating a press conference on January second, <laughs> but uh, but getting back to Jim Knowles, uh, and maybe I'm, you know, setting myself up for disappointment. But uh, everything I've read about him is that he seems, you know, the the words of Mike Gundy, his former boss, uh, he referred to him as kind of a quote mad scientist end quote uh, when it came to you know locking himself in the room and. Uh, not coming out, you know, for a couple of days, you know, and getting his players in the best position possible to be successful. And he runs a, a four, two, five. And before people that are skeptical of that four, two, five, you know, read too much into it. 
uh, it sounds to me like there is going to be ample opportunities for players that are very versatile athletically, such as, you know, like Jack Sawyer seems to be a name uh, who could be a prime beneficiary of this switch where he could be playing a position uh, called the Leo, which is kind of a, a defensive end as well as linebacker that, mm-hmm. that moves around. Um, and the only reason I'm, I'm bringing up Jack Sawyer's name is, and this kind of goes back into when we were talking about recruiting is that, um, you know, Jack Sawyer in the limited time that he played this past season, uh, from what I understand, Jack Sawyer was an outstanding basketball player in high school. So like the athleticism to be able to not only rush the passer, but also, you know, drop back into coverage that this might, this mm-hmm. might fit ideally into Jack Sawyer's skill set. Um, I mentioned earlier about, you know, like Sonny Styles. Um, again, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, lead too much on, you know, like somebody who's coming in as a true freshman. Who no, Chip, Chip, you put it on him. Put it on him now. <laughs> um, but that, those are the kind of, the, those are the kind of things that, that have me excited about Jim Knowles is that um, he sounds like a very unique individual. Um, I believe that he is a graduate of Cornell, spent some time on Wall Street before he got the coaching bug, um, is a vegetarian, uh, is also the kind of guy that um, after a victory is known to, in the in the spirit of Red Auerbach, light up a victory cigar. So I wonder how that's going to play in a, non- a non-smoking venue like Ohio Stadium. Um, like I said, <laughs> it, it's it, he has me intrigued. And uh, the one thing that I would say is that, you know, we talked about the transfer portal and I'm not going to throw out names because I, I would be just making things up mm-hmm. is it would be interesting to see um, if there are going to be a, let's just say a linebacker or a defensive back or whoever from Oklahoma state who might follow Jim Knowles. And I'm not saying necessarily even to start, although that would be a, a seemingly a a likely possibility, but a a player that might want the opportunity to come up and play for Jim Knowles and contribute and help with the new defensive terminology, uh, you know, like understanding the scheme, you know, like those kind of things, like it would not be surprising to me. I mean, we're, we're kind of going into unknown territory here with the fact that Ohio state had a full coaching staff and I'm not trying to sound uh, like a, you know, a predictor of doom here, but okay. You can only have so many coaches on staff. Somebody's going to be mm-hmm. going in yeah. some way, shape or form. We don't know who, but I don't know, you know, like what kind of conversations have been had. Uh, you know, if Jim Knowles, if there are, you know, let's just say that, you know, Jim Knowles, from what I understand, uh, his focus has usually been around the linebacker position. If does he envision himself coaching the linebackers? Who knows? I mean, it, it's going to be interesting to see this off season. That's why I'm saying like whatever that press conference, whenever that happens, I think that's going to be must see must hear TV for Ohio state football fans. Yeah. The thing I like about Jim Knowles is that I've, I've watched a lot of big 12 football and the big 12 is not known for competent defenses. And he managed to put one together. So I like that because I've watched a number of, you know, generally in the Big 12, if you have a good defense, that means you can hold the opponent to under 30 points. Uh, but Oklahoma State, a little better than that. Well, from what I understand, didn't he, I mean, in terms of this past year, and, and you would know better than me because I know like you're like, you know, Mr nightlife football you know on saturday nights when i'm already i'm already zonked out uh but all seriousness like in terms of he was able to figure out what oklahoma wanted to do or baylor wanted to do and in essence basically shut them down like his you know whatever you know was working for oklahoma or baylor or whoever he was playing against he he took away whatever was working Mm -hmm. and regardless of whether it was like at the onset or midway through the game he was able to make those critical in-game adjustments and and do enough that Oklahoma State. I mean, they they finished third in the country. And like you said, they're not the they come from a conference that is not renowned for defense behind 
Georgia and Wisconsin, Oklahoma State was ranked third, I think, in terms of overall defense. And this kind of goes back into why people are excited about this hire is, and I mean this with no disrespect to Oklahoma State's players, you know, we were just talking about recruiting the, you know, like that roster was not necessarily chock full of guys who were, you know, top name, right. You know, right. National recruits. Right. Now he did, he, he did he more gets, with less potent. I mean, there you th- go. theoretically he did more with less. He, he, they finished seventh in scoring defense this year. Um, they actually were tied with Penn state, uh, giving up 16.8 points per game. And again, the offenses in the big 12, some pretty prolific offenses in the Big 12. I mean, right. you know, Oklahoma, Baylor, um, I mean, there's uh, there's there's no defense typically in that conference. And there's a lot of good offenses typically in that offense. And and he managed to have a you know, a good season in terms of you know, keeping the other teams from scoring, which means your team doesn't have to score as much. And if you have a good offense like Ohio State does although they're going to be losing some guys you, all you have to all this team this year had to do chip was be a little more competent on the defensive side of the football and they don't lose any games this year I know I know that was that was the, the frustrating thing is that um, you know I, I I freely admit I looked at the 2020 season just you know with all of its Start, starts and stops and you know COVID issues and things like that that I thought okay that that was the reason why but um, as we saw unfortunately against Oregon against that team up north um, you know there were a lot of underlying things in terms of just you know just poor play you know throughout throughout all three levels and I think Jim Knowles can come in and it may not necessarily be you know, like an immediate, Oh, like, Oh, like everything is fixed. I don't want, I don't want fans to be up in arms. Like if, you know, like the spring game, if there are still some things, I think it, it's going to take some time uh, because you're talking not only a new coach, but potentially new terminology, new, you know, new scheme, you know, getting people all acclimated. And I don't think you can necessarily get that all taken care of in 15 spring practices. Yeah. Um, that I, I, I think probably by, let's just say, you know, by the end of the first month, you know, I'll be anxious to see what kind of impact Jim Knowles has had on getting the Ohio State defense back to, as you said, a more competent, capable unit. Yeah. So, I mean, to to, just to put a bow on your point earlier, um, Oklahoma State played Baylor, held them to 14 points in the regular season win. And then December 4th, um, held them to 21 points in a 21-16 loss in uh, um, Big 12 championship game. So There you go. Uh, not bad because Baylor scored a lot of points on a lot of teams this year. They did give up 33 to Oklahoma. Um, but, I mean, for Oklahoma's offense, that's that's not that bad, really. And everything else was pretty good. I mean, they, they held, the, they held the, the bad teams to without a touchdown. The bad teams in the conference, um, Kansas, West Virginia, Texas Tech, uh, you know, even got a shutout at Texas Tech. I mean, you don't see a lot of shutouts in college football these days. No, you don't. That's un- that's that's highly unusual. Yeah. So. All right. Uh, Chip, we talked about the new defensive coach that will officially uh, take over after the bowl game. We talked about the recruiting class, talked about the transfers out do do we get any transfers in was there a punter that came in and brought some dr pepper with him no there was no no (laughs) punter coming in um but there is a transfer in in the spirit of steel chambers Mm -hmm. a linebacker um actually a running back turning turning linebacker um an ohio native um by the name of uh demonte trainum um, who previously for the last two years has been at Arizona State, uh, is uh, Christmas, it, it was a Christmas Day commitment. So I guess you could say, like, here was a present under Ryan Day's tree, metaphorically, so to speak. Um, and I guess uh, Trainum has had conversations with Jim Knowles about 
you know, coming in, he's excited about the opportunity to switch over from running back to linebacker based on what I understand, you know, kind of flipping back when we were talking about recruiting is that Trainum uh, was recruited by Ohio State, uh, but Ohio State was trying to convince him he played both running back and linebacker uh, um, out of uh, Akron Archbishop Hoban, um, that they tried to convince him that his future was better served at linebacker. He disagreed, went to Arizona State, played running back mm-hmm. for the last couple of years. But he's coming to Ohio State to play in linebacker. There isn't this is not going to be a oh, let me let me come into a crowded running back room. He's coming in as a linebacker. So that's why I said, like in the in the spirit of Steel Chambers. Uh so it's gonna be interesting to see, you know, with with you know, like we saw how well Steel Chambers did uh without, you know, necessarily playing linebacker at all, uh, except during the, the regular season. Like he didn't have the, the spring practices train going to get that, you know, he's going to get the mm-hmm. winter conditioning, the, the, the spring practices. And, you know, going back to the whole Jim Knowles thing, everybody should look at this as kind of like an opportunity for a fresh start. You know, those, those players on the defensive side of the ball, you know, the, you know, yeah, obviously Knowles is going to come in. He's going to be watching the film, but everybody has an opportunity to make a good positive first impression on a new coach and, you know, possibly, see you know where they land on the defensive on the defensive depth chart and that includes Demonte Trainum. Yeah. And did you get to see Trainum play uh, when he was at Archbishop Hoban? I did not. Um you know he's one of those guys that I just know it was one of these things where um you know speaking as as a lifelong Ohioan, you know you're used to to um you know, players when they're being recruited, uh, you know, like a lot of the guys uh, around the area, around the Cleveland area, oh, okay, well, like either going to, you know, Mac schools and or Cincinnati and or, uh, you know, like if there are other Big Ten schools or maybe like Kentucky has become more prominent. Um, Arizona State, to come into the state of Ohio and get a player, that just seemed kind of odd. Yeah. Uh, but no, I, I did not have an opportunity to to see him play live. But I'm I'm excited the fact that Ohio State originally recruited him as a linebacker, and he's coming back even though he hasn't played linebacker. That um, you know we'll see if the original projections by the Ohio State coaching staff uh, turn out better for Trainum. Yeah, number five in the state for the 2020 class. That's uh, it's pretty high, uh, highly ranked recruit. I will say this for a guy who's willing to switch to linebacker, he averaged 5.4 yards per carry and had 10 touchdowns in, in two seasons with Arizona state. Yeah. I mean, but he, I mean, unless, you know, unless I'm seeing something incorrectly is um, in terms of his physical dimensions. I mean, we talked about, you know, Ohio state needing to be more physical on the defensive side of the ball, more, mm-hmm. you know, um, I think he's listed at 5'11", 235. I mean, you know, like, and we saw, you know, Steel Chambers running around, um, you know, not necessarily, I'm not, I don't want to say that he didn't know what he was doing, but I mean, like, just being, okay, like he had a nose for the football. Yeah. I'm anxious to see if, if Trainum has similar characteristics and traits. Yeah. The other thing too is I believe he was, I believe he was in line to become the starting running back next year. So, yeah, uh, very curious. I don't know if it was just homesickness or or what it was, but hey, it's Could good to been. have him. It's good to have him. Could have been. Welcome back. Maybe he just doesn't like the desert. I well, then we have to have a talk. Cause... Well, your your skin gets all dry out there, and you know. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's good to have some good news in the transfer portal. Uh, to go with uh, the bad news. So, uh, and I believe, does he not go by the nickname of Chip? I think so. I think he does. So uh, you're, you're all on board. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. At uh, his, uh, his Twitter is at yeah. chippers. Yeah. I saw that. So if you want to follow him, C H I P P E R R Z underscore. There you go. You can tweet. Don't tweet up. Don't don't tweet at players. Yeah, but. please don't tweet. Yeah. <laughs> please don't. Uh, but but if you do, just say hey, 
how come you how come you playing linebacker here and you you were going to be the starting running back? Maybe he'll answer you. you Anyway, yeah. Uh, Welcome home, Mr. Trainum. All right. Uh, Will Chip? uh, If there's nothing more, uh, there was one other quick thing I wanted to talk about. Just wanted to make uh, see what you made of Steel Chambers remarks about the the defense playing soft against Michigan uh guilty as charged um <laughs> you know like I I I mean I said it I, you know before and I know that you know I I didn't take any pride or happiness in saying it mm-hmm. but they were Ohio State was soft they were very um, soft they were very soft and and you know, I know that a lot of Ohio State fans rightfully took umbrage with the comments, you know, that Josh Gaddis, the Michigan offensive coordinator, you know, and all these things. It's like, hey, you know, if you want to shut those guys up, play better, play play tougher next time. And yeah. I think, you know, that getting back to what you asked me about Steel Chambers, for him to acknowledge that, okay, you know, it's all right. I think this is an opportunity for – Jim Knowles to come in and try to, you know, develop a a culture of toughness that I don't know what happened this year, but, you know, like in terms of, okay, no, you want to be tough and nasty and physical and okay. You know, against, you know, not just Michigan, but every team in the big 10. And, yeah. and I think still chambers for him to acknowledge, you know, what, 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 what was said, and let's face it, you know, Josh Gaddis and Jim Harbaugh, they and, uh, you know, everyone, you know, that, you know, is I, I give Michigan credit. I mean, for the first time in 10 years, they have a, a, a win in, in the game and the rivalry. But they've done a great service for Ohio State by giving Ohio State plenty of motivational quotes that should be on an endless loop in the Woody Hayes Athletic Center between now and November 26th. <sighs> That sucks. I was hoping that I dreamed that. It was just a bad dream. But you just confirmed that it actually took place. Sorry. Sorry. <sighs> All right. Well, speaking of things on a loop, every linebacker that plays for Ohio State should be forced to sit down and watch just play after play of Chris Spielman, uh, Andy Katz and Moyer, Steve Tovar, Derek Eisenman. I mean – the linebacker legacy at this school has not been lived up to in recent years, and it needs to get back to that. Well, I agree. I mean, like here was, you know, we were talking about, you know, like linebacker legacy, um, you know, just one of the things that I happen to take advantage of today, just kind of, you know, with being on the Big Ten Network is they're showing the Ohio State win over Alabama in the 2015 Sugar Bowl. Mm, yeah. And, you know, you watch, you know, you want to talk about, okay, Darren Lee, you know, like just running around, you know, you know, Joshua Perry, uh, you know, like they, you know, like just, you know, you're talking those guys, they were, uh, you know, well, Darren Lee was, was a first round draft choice in the NFL, but I mean, you, you know, playing with reckless abandon. Um, yeah. And that's what we have to get back to. James Laurinaitis. There you go. I mean, some of these guys weren't even real. I mean, some of these guys weren't even really big guys or highly recruited guys. If you go back in time and watch them, and they just played with all heart and power and everything they had. And I know that the game has changed somewhat over the years, and and linebackers are not necessarily built the way they used to be built. They don't. They're not asked to do some of the same things. But the fundamentals of football, of you know playing hard nosed and playing hard every down and making life just miserable for the other team. That's that hasn't changed for defenses. No, it hasn't. I mean, you know, we talk about, you know, the, the great linebacker play, um, you know, I think there's, I mean, it, it's, it's a difficult task for Ohio state in the sense that when you're in the big 10 and you're, going to be playing against, you know, for example, you know, like not just potentially, but like Ohio state, their 2022 schedule, all right. They're going to be playing against Iowa. They're going to be playing against Wisconsin. So, you know, you have to have solid linebacker play against the run, but then 
you know, when you are going to be playing against, you know, other teams, not Purdue. only in, in, yeah, in the big 10 that, yeah, that, that are more of a spread. So it, it requires a great deal of versatility by your linebackers, which again, I think, you know, I, you know, let's, let's compensate for, um, I'd, I'd rather a guy who may not necessarily be, uh, you know, I, I I don't want to say like, I'm, I'm not going to bash like the recruiting rankings, but like, give me get just a guy that's just an instinctive football player and gets to the ball and yeah. gets the player, gets the, the player down to the ground. And we'll worry about, Oh, you know, like, well, how fast and how strong I, I, I that to me is immaterial. As long as they get there and knock the, knock the guy down from, for, from making positive yards, we'll be good. Yeah. Yeah, they don't all have to be Pepper Johnson, but you know, that's right. It, it would be nice if they were. <laughs> yeah, it would be nice if they were. <laughs> all right, Chip. Let us get to our Utah and Ohio State Rose Bowl uh, talk. Our preview. We'll do that right after we get done with this. <laughs> Okay, we're back, Chip, and it is time to talk about the Rose Bowl. If we had done a podcast in the 80s or 90s, uh, if podcasts had existed then, we would be very excited about this game. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the the Rose Bowl, you know, used to be in, you know, the, the, the grand constellation of, of bowl games. Like, this was what Ohio State fans were, were wanting on a yearly basis. And mm-hmm. everything that is, has transpired with the college football playoff, the Rose Bowl now is, is, is just not nearly as lustrous as it used to be. Correct. And what I think that some of these bowl games do now, is some of these, um, especially the higher profile ones, if they're not part of the college football playoff, what happens is you end up with teams in these games sometimes, like in this one, they had bigger goals than this. And you have other teams who maybe started the season with just, let's just win our conference and, or even our division maybe. And then when they get to the end of the season and they get to this point, sometimes those teams are much more excited to be in this game. So you can have upsets pretty easily in a game like this. You can, you can have teams come in with, you know, maybe they're they're underdogs or whatever, and they they might go out and dominate the game because they want to be there more than the other team does. Even though the teams always say the right things and they say, "Well, we want to go out on a positive and we want to you know work hard and blah blah blah," and it's just not human nature uh, to be that way. And I think that although there are more than just this reason, I think for for this reason and others. You see guys go, you know what, it's a Rose Bowl. Eh, I'm not into it. I'm not going to play. And so Ohio State has several starters not playing in the Rose Bowl, including Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson. Uh, Chris Olave, who had a chance to play in his home state for his finale, decides, nah, not going to do it. Uh, Garrett Wilson's not going to do it. Nicholas Petit Frere, starter on the offensive line. And Garrett, uh, Haskell Garrett, on the starter on the defensive line, have all opted out for the Rose Bowl game. Well, I have to confess that, you know, the the, the Garrett Wilson announcement was not a surprise. I mean, like I, I, the surprise, if I may say so, was, okay, what took you so long to make the <laughs> announcement? Kind of a thing. Yeah. Uh, but I, again, I, I, I certainly respect. You know, all all four young men. I, I respect their decisions. I I, I understand where they're coming from. Uh-huh. The surprise, as it relates to Chris Olave, as you said, was okay. He's not only from California, but the images of him participating in the Rose Bowl practices up until the announcement had me thinking, "Wow, okay, I guess he is going to play." Mm-hmm. And then he decided to opt out again. He his his reason you know i you know maybe for fear of injury which is certainly a well well rounded decision um or you know understandable decision you know it, when you think about players in from other teams in previous bowl games that again were not for the national championship you know players who 
lost millions of dollars at the at the next level um, mm-hmm. by participating in a bowl game. I certainly don't. I have nothing. Uh, all four players certainly, you know, have contributed greatly to Ohio State uh, during their time in Columbus. So I wish them nothing but the best. But yeah, I was kind of surprised that that Chris Olave was, you know, you saw him in all these, you know, uh, Rose Bowl uh, activities, and 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 then for him to announce that was that was the, the surprise for me. Yeah the the important thing is that if he knew he wasn't going to play in this game, and we don't really know when that decision was ultimately made that he not take reps away from someone who was going to be taking his place, that he may have maybe run with the twos or whatever, the threes and not, or just worked out just to stay in shape and and to get better and work on some techniques and things like that and not taking snaps away in practice from guys that CJ Stroud is going to have to rely on. I agree. Uh, You know, we don't know, you know, maybe Chris Olave has been the best scout team player uh, you know for ohio state um <laughs> you know like honestly it's like we don't know right you know, because it, it's the kind of thing like i completely agree with you like it, it is pure speculation is it going to be um you know marvin harrison jr taking garrett wilson's place is it going to be julian fleming taking chris a lot you know like we have no idea is it mecca buka you know who is going to slide into those two positions you can only hope as you said, that they're not taking valuable reps away from, you know, Fleming, Harrison, Egbuka, whoever it might be that, that, you know, CJ Stroud needs to develop that, that comfort and chemistry with, you know, prior to January 1st. Yeah. Because we've already seen what CJ Stroud uh, or how it can affect CJ Stroud to not have Garrett Wilson in a game. We've seen that. That's right. It Absolutely. didn't look great. <laughs> it wasn't a great it, look. It did not. So, so what you've got here is you've got no Garrett Wilson, no Chris Olave. So that that leaves you Jackson Smith and Jigba, um, Emeka Egbuka, uh as the top pass catching wide receivers. That are, obviously, it's great to have Jackson Smith and Jigba. Um, Emeka Egbuka has shown a tremendous amount of talent, but you know he hasn't played a lot of receiver this year. And Marvin Harrison has five receptions this year. So there's not a lot there. So, you know, even if they got every first team snap or every first team rep in every practice in the lead up to this game, that's not even close to what C.J. Stroud is used to having on the field. No. I mean, you just rattled off in terms of, like, some stats. You know, like Garrett Wilson had... (laughs) 70 receptions. Chris Olave had 65. So, okay, 135 receptions between the two of them. If you take Julian Fleming, seven, Ibuka, uh, Emeka Ibuka, six, and Marvin Harrison Jr.'s five, so you're at 18 versus 135. Mm-hmm. At six I mean, yards short of 2,000 yards receiving, you've lost. Exactly. This exactly. Um, and, and, you know, even though Fleming – saw more snaps Fleming only had seven catches this year that's right and you know he's one of those guys that let's face it you know like I think the fan base is starting to wonder okay you know because he came in the same you know like he came in the same recruiting class as Jackson Smith and Jigba Mm -hmm. you know he hasn't really had you know nearly the impact um, that Jackson Smith and Jigba has had so this could be a tremendous opportunity for Fleming to, to really rise to the occasion. I mean, this is the kind of thing where, uh, you know, you're usually waiting until the spring to yeah. see, all right. And, and it's just the circumstances have changed. And so now, you know, Fleming, Harrison, Egbuka, uh, who's to say Jaden Ballard. I mean, I have no idea, you know, in terms of who's going to emerge, but, we're going to see some different wide receivers beginning on January 1st. Yeah. Jaden Ballard, by the way, has played in three games. So by my math, he can play in one more game still red shirt. Right. That's <laughs> what I mean. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a crazy thing in terms of that whole, you know, it used to be, you know, when we, when we would think, okay, well like, no, you can't play in anything. Um, 
and you know then you know, then you were considered a redshirt. But yeah, to be able to play up up to four games, um, you know, and still be redshirted. I mean, it's a tremendous opportunity for these guys. Yeah. So you know when I said that. You know, the, a game like the Rose Bowl might mean more to one team than the other, and and again, you've got you've you've got Utah who didn't start the season all that well, but came on strong and finished strong, and you've got Ohio State who they, everybody was playing for college football playoff, and it didn't happen, and now you've got these guys that are out, and that is exactly how a team like Utah has now, in my opinion, Chip should be favored to win this game. They should be. They absolutely... Well, let's face it. Not only are they more excited, here's... I mean, here's something that I think has... If most Ohio State fans, I think, are aware of it, but should, I mean, make them follow your your line of thinking, is, all right, when we talk about common opponents, Ohio State was... I'll, I know that they only lost by a touchdown, but they were decisively beaten by Oregon. I know it was only seven points, but the reality is, like, Oregon dominated Ohio State in Ohio Stadium. Particularly and, in the first half. And particularly in the first yeah. half. So, common opponents, Utah beat Oregon twice in the span of two weeks. Um, the first time, you know, uh, 38 to seven, the second time for the conference championship, 38 to 10. So, you know, when you talk about a team that not only has more motivation to come to the Rose bowl, this is the first Rose bowl in, in Utah's football history. Um, they're, they're more excited to be there, but they also decisively handled an opponent that had basically no trouble dominating Ohio state in Ohio stadium. Right. And this is a, a when Utah joined the Pac-12, that was a I mean the 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 Rose Bowl was still a big prize. This yes. is a school that really this is a, a a big marquee game for them. Now for Ohio State it, and yes, there's there's chip I'm I'm sure there's listeners thinking, yeah, the Rose Bowl still means something. It's still important. These guys should want to play. There's no reason to not want to play. And it's just human nature. I mean, if you have been told all year long you're getting a Ferrari. You're getting a Ferrari. At the end of this year, you're getting a Ferrari. And then at the end of the year, you get a Honda Civic. Hey, it's nice, but it's it's not what you were expecting, and you're not going to be as excited about it. It's just human nature. I completely agree. I, I think um, the, the players so far have been doing and saying all the right things um, in terms of, oh, we're excited to be there, and, you know, I know that they got a chance to visit Disneyland, and mm-hmm. unfortunately, the Lowry's, uh, you know, prime prime rib competition was called off due to COVID concerns <laughs> and all that. Um, I'm sure Dewan Jones was was going to do some damage there. Oh yeah, what anyone sure. says. But <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Utah wants to be there more than Ohio State, without a doubt, yeah. without it, without question. So it's it's up to the Buckeyes to show me. Show me that what you're saying is is true. Show me that you want to go out there and win this game and, and make up for the bad taste in your mouth from the Michigan game and all that. You've got to show me. But even if they want to show me that, again, you're looking at a C.J. Stroud-led offense that now has to recalibrate and it's not that he doesn't have talent at wide receiver. It's, it's that he doesn't have experienced talent at wide receiver. And it's not, it's going to look a little clunky. And they may have to find some other things to do. They may have to use Travion Henderson more in the passing game, for example. Yeah, and Travion Henderson, let's face it, um, we were talking earlier about you know Ohio State not being physical against Michigan. This this Utah defense is very physical. It's yeah. going to it, it's it's this is going to be, you know, it, this is truly going to, you know, with Travion Henderson, I think your best opportunities are to try to get him isolated in space versus trying to, you know, use him to to borrow your uh analogy of a, of a Ferrari. Um I'm not going to try and run my Ferrari, you know, like 
you know, like to, to run people over. I'm going to try and use my Ferrari to, to sprint by. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what Travion Henderson is. And I, I just think it's going to be interesting to see how the Ohio State offense, minus experienced wide receivers, how they the, their next best explosive option on offense is Travion Henderson, how they use him. And hopefully it'll be more as a receiver out of the backfield. Yeah, it will not surprise me if they just double Jackson Smith and Jigba and take their chances with the other uh, young wide receivers. That's what I would do, but um, I'm not a football coach, Chip. So maybe <laughs> maybe I'm way off on this uh, this strategy. What do you think? No, I don't think you're way off at all. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think Jackson Smith and Jigba will certainly be getting a lot more of the attention of the Utah secondary. Um, you know, and I think, you know, we can only we can only hope that, as we said earlier, that this news of the opt outs did not come as a surprise to Ryan Day, that this is just more of Ryan Day just kind of, hey, by the way, national media, here's kind of what's going on, mm-hmm. um, you know, you know, as or, as it leads up to the game. Um, now, granted. You know, I think that news was going to would have would have, you know, somehow leaked out, even if Ryan Day had tried to keep it suppressed. Um, Maybe this is kind of a motivational ploy to those backup wide receivers like, hey, you guys need to bring your A game because we're, we're down two of our better players on the offensive side of the ball. Yeah. And and yes, uh, a lot of people will be listening to this podcast and go, hey, next man up, next man up, man. You're right, <laughs> but uh, you're talking about next man up. Uh, you just lost two guys that have been dominating in college football for a couple of years now, and you just don't, you just don't replicate that immediately. It takes time. It takes reps. It takes game experience. So we'll see how that goes. Um, the Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave rumors about opting out started what the day that the matchup was announced? Yeah. So I mean, I mean, it's it's been out there, and it just was never confirmed. Right. I mean, I agree with something that I believe that you tweeted, as it related to Haskell Garrett. Yeah, um, I was going to get to that. I was going to yeah. get to that. Uh, Haskell okay, so. Haskell Garrett, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the last thing that he put on game tape, the Michigan game is not covering him in glory. And I would have thought that somebody who went out like that would have said, no, that's not going to be my last game as a Buckeye. I'm going to come out and I'm going to prove, and I'm going to show you how I played last year and at times this year. Right. I I completely agree with you because with Utah offensively, they're going, I mean, like off, you know, like they are more of a, you know, again, kind of like the, the teams that, Ohio State lost to this year, you know, more of a, you know, like a ball control running offense. They actually have a very physical running back uh, from the Cincinnati area, Tavion Thomas, um, who, uh, you know, he ran for over a thousand yards this year. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Haskell Garrett, it would have been nice to have had, you know, somebody like Haskell Garrett on that interior Ohio State defensive line making things more difficult for, for Tavion Thomas to, to run effectively. Uh, so yeah, I, I, it was surprising because let's face it. I haven't seen any NFL draft projections with Haskell Garrett being a first round draft choice. You know, I, I would have thought that, right. right. As you said, he probably could have used this as a better showcase to put himself in a, you know, in a better perspective of NFL draft evaluation. Yeah, I mean, because he played really well last year, and Tommy Togi, I went pro, and he stayed, and I think that you could make a very easy case that Haskell Garrett, although he played quite well last year and played well at times this year, maybe not as consistently, he was helped by Tommy Togi's presence. Oh, easily. Yeah. Uh, you know, Tommy Togi, being a Cleveland Browns guy, um, he's only played sparingly, um, you know, with the Browns this year as a, as a rookie, he was a fourth round draft choice, but you're Mm -hmm. absolutely, I mean, like Haskell Garrett was a beneficiary of Tommy Togiai last year. Now, you know, when we talk about, you know, next man up, 
you know, who's going to take that place, you know, like this, this could be an opportunity for, I'm going to throw out a name here that, you know, somebody that, that you and I uh, thought should have played more. What about, you know, you know, Tyleek Williams, he you should know, like, play every down chip, <laughs> every down, give him, give him an opportunity on that interior defensive line. Um, you know, maybe this, this frees up an opportunity for him. Um, you know, obviously you've got other people like Antoine Jackson and, you know, Jerron Cage and, um, Teron Vincent, but yeah, like Tyleek Williams, maybe this is an opportunity for him to, to be a, a stronger presence in that re- defensive line rotation. Yeah, I, I think we need to see more of him, and I think we will next year, but I think it probably would not have hurt the team any if they would have played him more this year. Right, right. Um, sometimes you got to – I mean, sometimes coaches fall in love with with guys. Sometimes they don't want to show too much love to the to the freshmen at the risk of alienating uh, the, the upperclassmen. Um, but I, I say play the best players, and, and he – he made so many plays in limited time this year that, I mean, if if that's not how you earn more playing time, I don't know how you do. I, I completely agree. I think Tyleek Williams certainly should have played more, and you can only hope that maybe after reviewing the, the dreadful Michigan game film that they have come to their rightful senses and realize that they need to get him in there. I mean, when you and I talked about the fact that you know, as as beloved as Larry Johnson is as a coach, this was not his finest season coaching football. This is another one of those little things. I mean, we've we've talked about the the defensive ends have not been producing, and the the defensive line hasn't been occupying guys and keeping the linebackers clean, and and also that goes into who rotates in and out. Redemption is at hand against mm-hmm. you know against Utah. You know, like the you know. Our last, our last memories of Ohio State were watching them. Let's let's just call it. Watch them be pushed around mm-hmm. by by Michigan. Yeah. And the last thing in the world you want is okay, like to make that two in a row against a team that you know is is much more motivated to be there than than you are. Mm-hmm. Now I have seen Chip the Utah Utes. In action, uh, one time, and the one time, the only previous time that they played Ohio State, and that was a pretty easy win for Ohio State, and that came back on September 27th of 1986 in the Horseshoe Chip before the renovations, and that was just 13 days after my 20th birthday. There you go. Okay, and it was Unfor- sixty-four to six. Yeah, unfortunately, th- that that game film will be a, a minuscule value to Ohio State in their preparations <laughs> for this one. That's not going to help. No, it's not. They're they're like some game film from the from when Utah was in the whack is not going to help today. No, no, unfortunately. My so. lasting memory of that game, Chip, is sitting in Ohio Stadium and watching freshman running back James Bryant start the game and rush for 145 yards after an abysmal start to the season for the Buckeyes. The worst start for the team in 102 years. (laughs) I I almost forgot about that until you just referenced that. That's true. I forgot about that. And it was, I mean, it was a, they opened with a, almost got a win against Alabama in the kickoff classic that year, but um, they uh, fell short with an incomplete pass late in the game and lost 16 to 10 but they they lost a couple games then they were they were ready to bounce they bounced back against Colorado but it wasn't really a big it, they squeaked by a, a like a bad Colorado team I don't actually I don't know if Colorado was good that year or not Bill McCartney was coaching Colorado at the time so they may have been decent but um and then Utah and Ohio State ran for 394 yards that day. I mean, it was just ridiculous. And I remember thinking, this James Bryant, he's going to be pretty darn good. And that, that was the end of the story. <laughs> and then what happened? Exactly. Uh, yeah, James Bryant did not have a stellar career. Uh, he looked good that day. 
Um, but uh, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a great career for James Bryant. He he ran for 656 yards that season, and you know, like I said, huge chunk of it came in that one game. Um, he only ran for three touchdowns. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And the next year he ran for half the yardage and three touchdowns and then even less yard. I mean, he's the only running back I can remember who got worse as he went along. Um it it was not he he just kept getting passed on the depth chart and um yeah, it wasn't uh it wasn't to be for James Bryant, but uh, that day for all the world it, he looked like the next great Ohio State running back. Sounds like uh, he was the Lydell Ross of his time. Um, I don't even think he made it to Lydell Ross heights. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, he I don't think Lydell Ross, I, I could be misremembering because I, I like to block out a lot of the Lydell Ross years, but I don't think Lydell Ross maybe ever had a game as good as James Bryant had against Utah, but overall, Lydell Ross was a little more dependable. Okay. Uh, only old people know what we're talking yeah, about at this I know. point. I know. I know. All right, so getting back to the current Utah Utes chip, one of the problems for Ohio State is going to be that Utah defense, and part of the reason is because unlike Ohio State's defense against Michigan, the Utes on defense are not soft. No, they're not. They are um, led by linebackers that play and hit like we wish Ohio State linebackers would play and hit. The guy that that I'm excited to see just as a football fan, not not to see him inflict damage upon Ohio State, but just to watch as a football fan. Where's the, the number zero? Devin Lloyd. Mm-hmm. Um, listed 6'3", 235. And I think he's been characterized by Dane Brugler, who's one of the NFL draft analysts, you know, that is well-respected. Um, I think somebody said that he, he basically like the way he plays, he's, he's like a, a missile with arms, um, <laughs> that he just hits, uh, with reckless abandon. Um, you know, so he's going to be the guy that I think I'm going to be keeping an eye on, you know, like how Ohio state accounts for him. Yeah. He and Nephi Sewell, another linebacker, another junior linebacker are the leading tacklers on that defense. They, they lead the team. The Ohio State's offensive line has to get to the second level for the Buckeyes to be able to run the football at all. And they're going to need to protect, and they're going to need to be able to, to pick up blitzes and that kind of thing. Uh, Lloyd has more than 100 tackles this year. 106 tackles total, 62 solo tackles. He's averaging eight a game. I think you could probably count on one hand how many Buckeyes have had eight tackles in a game this season. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like I said, he's, he's the guy that and like, I think he's, he's a junior, but he's widely expected to declare for the NFL draft after this game. Oh yeah. If you're, if you got a hundred tackles, lead your team to a Rose bowl and you get the swag to wear number zero. Yeah. You're going pro after this. (laughs) (laughs) It's going to happen. So let's take a look at the Utes. The Utes, uh, Chip have they're very highly ranked on both sides of the football. Uh, the offense is ranked 19th in the country in scoring, 35 points per game. That doesn't bode well for this Ohio State defense. The rushing offense is 13th in the country. They're averaging 216.54 yards on the ground. Again, not what this defense wants to see on the other side of the football after what they've just experienced. Uh, passing offense not quite as strong, 87th in the country, 212 yards per game, and a lot of that uh, was with some pretty poor uh, play at quarterback early in the season, and we'll talk a little bit more about the quarterback play in just a bit, uh, and total offense, 46th in the country, 429 yards per game, and I think that tells you a lot about the state of college football nowadays, when you're getting 429 yards per game, and you're number 46 in the country. <laughs> yeah, I, I I never thought of it that way. In the yeah, '80s, but, that would have been yeah. like second, yeah. third, you know, yeah, easily, <laughs> easily. It's it's ridiculous. Um, 
but yeah, that's that's where we are with the game right now, and uh, that's that's just how it is. The uh, quarterback I talked about, Cameron Rising, has done a great job for Utah, and it's not just with his arm. He's uh, you know he's he's pretty efficient, sixty two point eight percent passer. He's thrown for two thousand two hundred seventy nine yards, eighteen touchdowns against only five picks. But he also makes a lot of plays with his legs. Uh, he's run for 407 yards and five touchdowns. And they run a lot of those RPOs. And this is where we're going to have to see if Ohio State has learned their lesson from a very difficult defensive year in terms of, like, who gets this? Is that going to be Steel Chambers' responsibility to keep an eye on Cameron Rising? I mean, I don't know. Somebody's mm-hmm. going to, you know, like, you can't just give up, just acknowledge that this guy's going to run for for yards on you. you know, you're going to have to have somebody to spy on him. Yeah, you mentioned Tavion Thomas, 100 and, I'm sorry, um, 1,041 yards on the season, 20 touchdowns, and he's averaging 5.6 yards per carry. He's essentially their uh, Travion Henderson. Absolutely, but – let's just say he's built more like Mayan Williams than Travion Henderson. I, yeah. I think in terms of physical stature mm-hmm. and another guy, I think that people are going to want to keep an eye on um, is Britton Covey, who is a junior wide receiver and he is just all over the field. He runs the football, he catches the football and I believe he's also their return man and a but- very good one. Didn't he? Didn't he opt out though? I think uh, did Britton go? Okay, out. yeah, you, he you, might you, he might have opt out. Yeah, so you know he, that might be that might be a, a a bullet dodge. Yeah, that's a bullet dodged if he did because he's certainly uh, excellent, um, an excellent football player. And I apologize for not doing my homework. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I I think I, I I thought I saw that. So it's kind of like one of those things where he you know because he's. You know, I I want to say that he's been playing since like 2015 or something, but he went on a mission and yeah, he's been around forever. (laughs) Yeah. You know, like, so, you know, let's face it, you know, it's like, but he's, he's definitely one of those sneaky, good players that you need to account for um, that hopefully as, as I believe that I thought I saw on Twitter. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. That's my bad. Uh, It happened. It happened a couple of weeks ago when I was actually on my trip to Ohio. So I missed that uh, when I was, uh, I was visiting back home and going to see Genesis at the uh, nationwide. There you go. There you go. So I, uh, that's, that was bad timing for me because I, I checked out a college football. It's understandable. I think the second after I, I hit, uh, submit on the grumpy old Buckeye after the Michigan game. I was out for uh, well until I was getting ready for this podcast. Essentially, I, I understand. <laughs> it's very, uh, it's it it certainly makes sense, especially I mean, like as we're recording this. I mean, um, Ohio State. You know, we were talking about players opting out, mm-hmm. but there are complete bowl games that are being canceled. You yes, know, you, you know, like so it's. You know, like, you want to count your blessings. I mean, we, we joke about, you know, like, oh, you know, like how uh, dreadful the Michigan game was. But, you know, I freely admit I'm going to be watching this game, uh, you know, with the with, with the belief that, okay, this is hopefully going to give me not only a glimpse into what the 2022 Ohio State defense, excuse me, uh, team could look like, mm-hmm. you know, like offensively and defensively. Um, but also, like you know, the fact that the simple reality is, like, until the spring game, I've got nothing, you know. So I'm, I've, I've got to savor, you know, this, you know, like no matter how it shapes up. Yeah, that's a, a big bullet dodged for Britton Covey to be out. Um, it, it didn't even occur to me that a Utah player might opt out of this game because, again, we talked about it. This is something that they have, they have put. You know, when Utah became part of the Pac-12, this was a goal for them for the as a school. And if you never played in a Rose Bowl, and now you have an opportunity to, most guys uh, would would take that. But uh, hey, got to do, got to make the decision that's right for you. I think Britton Covey may go higher than Haskell Garrett. I have no doubt. Yeah, <laughs> I have no doubt that he will. Uh, they do have a very good tight end. 
Brant Queeth, I think his name is uh, pronounced Queeth. Uh, he has 500 yards. They don't have a ton of guys that have a bunch of yards, but they've got a bunch of guys that have about the same amount of yards. They've they've got uh, well, counting Kobe, they had six guys with more than 230 yards uh, receiving. Uh, but Queeth has six touchdowns, and uh, a guy by the name of another tight end by the name of Dalton Kincaid has seven touchdowns, and the two combined have uh, just about a thousand yards receiving. So they like they like to use their tight ends. And the receivers haven't been like world beaters, but they can make plays. And Ohio State hasn't been extremely strong against the pass. So, no, they haven't. And again, I think it's all supplemented by the fact that they've got a traditionally very strong ground game. You know, like, yeah. and that's the thing that Ohio State that was. That, that they never seemed to, to figure that out against Oregon. They certainly didn't seem to figure it out against Michigan. So we'll see if the third time is the charm against Utah on January 1st. Yeah. One guy we didn't talk about at the top of the show, and I'm just going to do a quick aside, is that uh, did I hear correctly that Cam Brown is returning for next year? Cam Brown is returning. Yeah. That, so that's uh, the, that's kind of good. That's a positive. Yeah. That is a, that is a positive. I mean, and so – um, you know, we still haven't, you know, you, you want to talk about players opting out and player, you know, like you know, players announcing that they're coming back, Cam Brown coming back. There's, there's something that is to be a player to be excited about for, uh, 2022 when Jim Knowles comes in, like you've got, all right, your couple uh, key players with Denzel Burke mm-hmm. and, and Cam Brown in the secondary that that's something to build around. Chance to get himself in the first round next year. Potentially. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as we've seen, Ohio State cornerbacks will go very high if they have good seasons. So uh, so good to have Cam back. Anyway, scoring defense for Utah. Very good. 21st in the country, only allowing 20.6 points per game. And the rush defense is 23rd in the country, 122.69 yards per game. And the passing defense, 24th, so right about the same spot. 195.3 yards per game against passing. That's pretty darn good. And the total defense, 12th in the country, 318 yards per game. Chip, will the Buckeyes get more than 318 yards against this defense? Oh, uh, Putting you on I, the spot, man. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the over, but it's not going to be easy. How's that? Yeah. It's definitely not going to be easy if those uh, young receivers don't get some separation. Easily. That, that, that's exactly it. You know, like I, I would have felt if, if Chris Olave had been playing, I, I feel more comfortable, but you know, like, like I said, I, I had suspected Garrett Wilson to sit out Chris Olave. It's not a complete surprise, but just the, the mere fact that it, it's being announced as of tonight. Um, yeah. It, the, the passing game is going to be, that's going to be a something to keep an eye on for yeah. sure. So, I mean, Ryan Day's not, He's not a dumb person. He's not a stupid man. He knows that what he's going to see from Utah, he sees on film. He's, he's going to watch the film. He's going to see what they do. But what he's going to get on game day is he's going to get a lot of people in the box to stop the run and a double team of Jackson Smith and Jigba. So beat us some other way is basically what Utah's going to say on Saturday. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, Jackson Smith and Jigba is going to be a marked man, um, and it's going to be incumbent upon C.J. Stroud to buy time with his legs. Let's face it. You know, mm-hmm. he's not going to he he will not have the luxury of you know we we saw it against Michigan. Um, this Utah defense is going to come after him. So I, I've been <laughs> imploring him to take positive yards uh, when things break down. We, we can only hope that he will do just that against uh, against this uh, very tough Utah defense. And I'm anxious to see what the offensive game plan will be because I, I, I feel like I know what Utah is going to try to do. And then it's incumbent upon Ohio State to make them change. Uh, and then we have to see if, if they can actually do that. But this is a team that's got, um, you know, uh, Mika Tufua has nine and a half sacks defensive end. They have uh, Devin Lloyd has eight sacks. Van Fillinger five and a half sacks. I 
I think that's a lot of sacks because I've watched Ohio State this year and I didn't see that many sacks. Right, and let's face it, Nicholas, Nicholas petit Frere not being there on the offensive line, we have no idea how the offensive line is going to be reconstituted, I would guess, mm-hmm. and it's just purely a guess on my part, is that you know with you know Thayer Munford, uh, that you might kick him out to left tackle and have Matthew Jones at left guard. Um, that might be what they're planning on doing, but we have no idea. That's what I would do. I know. But that's know. me. Uh, here's a, here's a um, potentially hot take, Chip. Losing one of those big tackles helps the Ohio State offensive line. It certainly could. Uh, we'll see if they if they follow what we believe would be their best course of action. Let's let's see if they do that. We've talked this year throughout this year about at times this offensive line has struggled to open holes in the run game despite having size and experience and talent on the offensive line. And we have surmised that potentially some of that is because they don't have the, they don't have guards out there. They have five tackles. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is with, you know, next year, the 2022 offensive line will look different regardless. I mean, like they're going to lose, I mean, like, like Thayer Munford is going to be gone. So, you know, like Matthew Jones should be returning. Um, you have no idea, like Paris Johnson, he's playing out of position at guard, but he he's actually more of a natural tackle. Mm-hmm. But you're absolutely right. I think, you know, like the possibility of like Donovan Jackson at guard, uh, you know, like getting some, some natural guards into the offensive line could certainly be better for the Ohio State offense overall, especially the running game. Yeah. Now, as by way of comparison to the, the defenses, Haskell Garrett was Ohio State's leading sacker this year. He had five and a half. That would have placed him third on Utah, and he ain't playing. He isn't playing, and, you know, it's it's going to be interesting to see what kind of defensive what kind of defensive strategy Ohio State has, especially mm-hmm. against a team that has the physical components, um, you know, of the teams that beat Ohio State twice this year. Chip, do you know who was second on Ohio State in sacks this year? Tyleek Williams. You are correct, sir. Five <laughs> sacks. Play the man. <laughs> we'll hope. We'll he see. also had the most sack yards on the team. So, yeah. I, Chip, coaching is hard. You and I could do this. We could. And be <laughs> less expensive. That's We'd be sure. a lot less expensive and a lot more expendable. There you go. Uh, All right, so we've got all of the rankings. We've told you who on Utah you should watch out for. We told you a guy on Utah that you should watch out for if he didn't opt out, but he did. So (laughs) there's that. Um, And I think, unless there's anything else we need to discuss that I haven't thought of, we might. It might be time to get to our predictions and our uh, picks to click. Did I miss anything, Chip? Did we miss anything? No, no. I think we covered it thoroughly. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, Britton Covey, by the way, was their uh, their very dangerous return man as well. He had two punt returns for touchdowns this year, and uh, averaged fifteen just about fifteen yards per punt return. So it's good that that won't be there. <laughs> and uh, also, he was their kickoff return guy, and he averaged thirty yards on kickoff returns. So, uh, let us get to our. Uh, What's going to happen on, on in the Rose Bowl, Chip? I, I don't know what's going to happen. I think that um, – I don't even know how to feel about this game. I understand. I, under, I, I understand the apprehension. Uh, the opt-outs certainly do not make it uh, a peaceful, easy feeling, as the Eagles would say. Mm-hmm. Um, the, you know, this is this – is, you know, I think you, you cited a lot of – the reasons why Utah should be favored. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Utah definitely has the motivation. You know, Ohio State they're 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 playing for pride, um, yeah. and we'll just see what level of pride that is. Yeah, I agree. All right, Chip, it's time to get to our picks to click. We did not have a lot of success picking 
uh, clickers in the Michigan game. Uh, you started, we started on defense last time, so we'll start on offense this time. Who is your offensive pick to click? Well, um, can't go with the wide receivers. I just can't. Um, as tempting as, as it would be for Jackson Smith and Jigba, like I said, I think he's going to get his, his receptions, but I don't see him. Um, and he's, this this guy has been more of a no-show. Uh, but I have a feeling, you talk about C.J. Stroud needing somebody that he's comfortable and relying on. I'm going to go with Jeremy Rucker. Okay. All right. That was going to be my backup if you took my guy, Chip. Okay. I'm going to go with Trey all day. Okay. Travion Henderson. Um, he's going to have to run the football. He may have to catch the football. I anticipate that he will have to be a factor uh, both in the pass and run game for Ohio State to have a shot at winning this game against a physical Utah team that is up for the challenge and didn't this isn't a consolation for them. They worked upward for this. This is a this is the apex of their trajectory, whereas Ohio State uh, aimed for the sky, missed, and is now falling back, plummeting toward the earth. <laughs> um, is that is that uh, is that happy enough? Is that positive quite, enough? Quite, quite, quite the visual there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let us turn our attention to the defensive side of the football. I'm going to take Steel Chambers at his word and say he's going to have a bounce back game. Steel Chambers is my pick to click. Well, this is going to be a disappointment just simply because, oh, you know, like how original. But uh, <laughs> I'm going to go with Ronnie Hickman. Um, I Mr. Do It, everything, you know, for Ohio State defensively this year. I think he's going to be called upon a lot yeah. to, to compensate for Ohio State. That's a great pick. It's a great pick. Can't really go wrong. Can't. Uh, I have no. I have no criticisms of that pick. I mean, because, like you said, uh, he's been asked to do a lot this year, and and you know sometimes that's 15 yards downfield, but <laughs> it's still a tackle. Um, so. We've got our picks to click. We don't know how that's going to go. Really, this is a weird game. I just don't know what to expect from this game. It's going to be even hard, harder, I think, to make a score prediction. But we have to do that because that's what we do here. We we make score predictions. So, um, you know, I, I think Hickman's as good as anybody that, you know, you could have come up with. I think um, Denzel Burke was another guy that maybe could have gotten in the mix. Um, but really... The defense, there hasn't been one guy making a ton of plays this year. It's been, it's been sort of this guy one game, that guy one game, and uh, and then on the other side of the football, as long as one of us picked a wide receiver, we were probably getting a click. There you go. <laughs> All right, Chip, your score prediction, please. Utah Utes, Ohio State Buckeyes. Very tough. Um, the opt outs have really thrown this. You know, like I, I was leaning towards Ohio State, mm-hmm. but the 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 opt outs have me have me truly conflicted. I completely agree with you on the. I think the the motivation, the passion to be there is with Utah. I just don't see Ohio State having enough where it counts in terms of like being able to grind it out. Um, I think, you know, like the off season, they'll have, to, they'll have to work on the running game. I don't see it being enough against Utah. So I'm going to go Utah 38, Ohio State 31. Okay. Well, once again, you and I are not far off from what our thinking is. You know, you motivation aside, those particular opt-outs are – I mean, it, you just can't overstate what Wilson and Olave bring to a college football team. Um, these guys may be both starting in the NFL next year. Mm-hmm. It is it is ridiculous how much they've played and how much they've contributed to the success of this team. And in some ways, it's ridiculous that the coaching staff allowed them to become that important um, and not rotate more. 
Uh, but it is what it is, and that's what has happened the last two years. I think without COVID, maybe other guys get more chances, but because of the way that the last two seasons have unfolded, these guys have just, they they haven't, the team hasn't gotten out there to big leads like they have in past to where you can give these younger guys more playing time, more reps, more catches, and build their confidence, and then they can step in a little easier. Um, the last guy that did that was Jackson Smith and Jigba, and he didn't really have a ton of catches the year before he became a starter. Agreed. He, I mean, like he, he just really showed up in the spring, which gave them the confidence that he was ready to go this year. Yeah. So I think the, if it wasn't just the motivation, you've added in the, the, not just opt outs, but very, very key opt outs. Um, and on, you know, just on top of all of that, there's, there's this, not a cloud exactly hanging over Ohio state, but there are, there are defensive coaches, there are coaches on the staff that know they're not going to be there next year. I guarantee you they know they're not going to be there. And you wonder how much that creeps into their preparation for this game. Very good point. Very so, valid point. I, like you, am predicting a Utah victory in this game, and I've got Utes 34, Ohio State 30. Okay. And and I'm worried that I'm overstating Ohio State's offensive output. So am I. I, I think maybe if they get more than 24, it might be a win against that defense. We'll see. With the guys just... they have out. I mean, and, and I know there's people listening to this podcast that are thinking, what are you talking about? Look at all the talent. I understand that. It's just that we've watched it. We've watched it all year. And the the two security blankets are not there for C.J. Stroud. So it, it's like, did they have time? For uh, to use a Rocky analogy, did they have time for, uh, for Rocky to be trained to fight right-handed so then he could suddenly change back to southpaw at the at the critical moment? Uh, I don't know. I don't know that they had that much time. Yeah, we'll never know. I mean, in terms of when these nuggets of information were known to the coaching staff, you can only hope it was early. Mm-hmm. Um. You know, maybe again, you know, it's like, okay, like you said, you know, using that Rocky analogy, maybe it was early on. And this is the great strategy is that, okay, like Julian Fleming and um, Ameka Ibuka or, or whoever, mm-hmm. um, that they're, they're ready to go. Yeah. I, I agree with what you said earlier that, I mean, it's, you're talking, a, a, you know, a significant portion of the offense um, is gone. So, compensating for that very quickly in a, in a few weeks. I'm not sure that that the the coaching staff throw in the fact that there's going to be turnover on the defensive side. I think there there's it's understandable that Ohio State's not going into this necessarily with the right frame of mind. Yeah, there's a lot to overcome and a lot of it is mental and a lot of it's momentum. So we'll see how it goes. This is not uh, this coaching staff's first go around, and they've 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 been parts of these games before, and you know maybe that will be something that they can they can rely on as they've prepared for big games like this before. I, I don't know. There's maybe we're being a little doom and gloom, and, and maybe it'll turn out to be for nothing, and that would be nice. I I would be very happy to be wrong. <laughs> so would I. So would I. So, uh, you know, whether that is the young receivers are going to play a big role, whether it's uh, we're going to see three tight ends in a bunch formation, or whether we're going to see Trayvon Henderson split out more with Mayan Williams in the backfield. I mean, who can say? But, you know, we've, we're have we going to have to wait and see what Ryan Day dials up and, and what his game plan is and then hope that that game plan is a successful one. Because if, if, he, if he's designed something that doesn't work, Utah's a good enough team to win this game easily. I agree. Compared to what they did to Oregon, absolutely. Yeah. All right, Chip. Well, this is uh, this is it. This is the last show for 2021. You and I will be back in the first week of 2022 to uh, review what we saw in the Rose Bowl and make sense of the season as a whole. 
yeah, let's hope for an Ohio State victory. Yeah, and the next time we convene, we might know more about what the coaching staff will look like in 2022. We might know more about who might be going pro and who might announce that they're staying and that kind of thing. So it, it's it's an exciting time in college football. This is the the big week, and even though there's stuff going on that we would love for Ohio State to be part of, and they're not, um, you know, there's only a couple – there's only a few a few precious college football games left in our college football season. Yeah, enjoy them while they while you got them. Yeah, and then we'll be in the long, dark yep. off season again. <laughs> again. All right, Chip. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of the Silver Bullets podcast. Chip, where can people find you on the internet? I can be found on Twitter at Chip Minnick. Last name is spelled M I N N I C H, and I'm. Besides podcasting with Michael, I'm also a contributor to Athlon Sports. Yeah. All right. Uh, You can find me on Twitter, at Mike36Fan. And uh, you can find me, uh, my writing, on BuckeyeScoop.com is the Grumpy Old Buckeye. And that article will run on Sunday, the day after the game. Chip, the only thing I know for sure is that this time against Utah, we won't see fullback George Cooper scoring four touchdowns. No, not at all, unfortunately. Uh, In fact, I don't think we'll see any fullback touchdowns, although you never know. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. (laughs) It's it's happened at least on one occasion this year, I believe. That's true, that's true. Did Mitch Rossi score a touchdown this year? Mitch Rossi did. Who's to say? Uh, Was that rushing or receiving, or did he have one of each? Receiving. Okay, he had so a no so. touchdown runs for Mitch Rossi. Mitch Rossi is the secret weapon confirmed. We can only hope there, is, <laughs> there might have been some COVID. Might have been some COVID players. Ryan Day addressed that, but we don't know who they are. So yeah, that's another thing too, Chip. That could throw everything we've just talked that's about right. for the last that's hour right. out the window. Is that both teams could be missing or not missing key guys because of of. Infections, COVID infections. Stay healthy. Stay yeah. stay away from everybody. Oh, man. This has been an exhausting two years of covering college football. I agree. <laughs> it's not going to get any better, unfortunately. Nope. So, All but, right. We, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's like, <laughs> you know, you can only hope that it gets better. That's it. Yeah. All right. We will be back next week, Chip, to wrap up the season for better or for worse. Until then, the only thing that we have left to do is to do what we always do at the end and say, Go Bucks! Go Bucks!